Welcome, my dear friends, to the last module of the massive open online course on freedom of expression, artificial intelligence, and elections. This course is organized by the Knight nice Center for Journalism in the Americas, together with UNESCO and UNDP. We also count with the support of the Electoral Assistant Division of the Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs of the United Nations. My name is Albertina Peterbar. I'm an electoral expert at the Freedom of Expression and Safety of Journalists section at UNESCO and the lead instructor of this course. So this is so exciting. We're starting our last module. So let's go. Hi again, and welcome back. In this section, I'll briefly talk about some of the techniques for verifying and detecting AI-generated content. I will specifically focus on manual detection, where individuals can analyze signs of AI-generated content but also automatic detection, where individuals can use AI to identify synthetic material. It's becoming really difficult to distinguish between human-generated work and AI-generated content. AI-generated content can imitate human writing styles and generate realistic audios, photos, and videos. However, AI-generated content is subject to glitches, which are sudden small faults in a system. And as the quality of these models is still improving, this could still allow the manual detection of such a content. One way to detect AI-generated content manually is by analyzing its metadata. For those unfamiliar with the term metadata, it's data that describes and provides information about other data. So when analyzing metadata, for example, you can look if the author left markers for you or notes in the metadata itself indicating that the content was generated by AI. Another way is to check the date and timestamps in the metadata, which might not match at the actual event date. Also, in some cases, the absence of certain metadata could be an indicator for you that this content is manipulated or generated by AI. Other than metadata, and another way to manually analyze AI-generated content is to look for glitches. For example, text-generated content could be checked manually by examining if the text includes repetitive content. In some cases, you might encounter a text stating some statements, such as, as an AI model, or I cannot complete this path, which are clear indicators for you that this content is generated by AI. Photos and videos could be analyzed manually too. AI content sometimes have glitches in individual body parts, including, for example, a human with extra fingers, body parts that are not connecting, small hands, and others. Also, photos created by AI, especially of people, often look a bit shiny, like they have been polished or airbrushed. In some cases, AI struggles to render text and images, such as throat signs, name tags, and labels, so look for all of these signs. When it comes to videos, look at the face of the speaking person, especially at the edges of the face, and look for unusual eye or body movements. Someone blinking too much or not at all could be a sign for you. Also try to pay attention to any difference between the visual lip movements and the audio. When it comes to audio, listen for speech patterns, robotic voices, or awkward pauses, which all, may all indicate that the audio is generated by AI. It's also very important to try to think about the bigger picture and the context. AI-generated content could be very exaggerated and also unrealistic. The quality of these AI models is still improving quickly, and it might be difficult for humans and fact-checkers to manually detect a big amount of content. Automatic detection and AI tools can play an important role in supporting you detecting synthetic content. As we say it, fighting AI using AI. This could include tools such as GPT-0, ZeroGPT, Originality, and CopyLeaks to detect AI-generated text. AI image detector, optic AI or not for the analysis of images and audio. Also deepware or fact catcher, for the analysis of video and deepfakes. Microsoft has also developed an authenticator tool to analyze photos and videos. Finally, AI speech classifier 
for the detection of audio. Having said all of this, it's really important to use multiple detection methods to be able to verify the information accurately. While the field of AI detection is quickly evolving, it's important to clarify here that the tools I mentioned are just a few examples of some of the available ones. Also, that does not imply at all the endorsement of any of them, but they are meant to highlight the different approaches that you can take yourself in detecting AI-generated content. It's also important to highlight here that as AI advances, the detection of AI-generated content both manually and automatically is changing. So we encourage you to keep learning and look for ways and tools for the detection of AI-generated content. We also encourage you to further research and examine other strategies and tools to promote the integrity of the digital content and safeguard our information ecosystem. Thank you. Hello again, and welcome to part two of our uh, fourth and last module. I'm going to talk about media and information literacy in the context of electoral processes and artificial intelligence generated electoral information and disinformation. But what exactly is uh, media and information literacy? Why is it so important? Well, citizens and voters are one of the main stakeholders of a democracy, and they need to be present in an ecosystem-based response to AI electoral-related use and misuse. Media and information literacy covers a broad range of skills that allows users to think critically about the information citizens and voters interact with online. MIL empowers individuals to access, create, analyze, and act on diverse types and formats of information, including from traditional media and online source. So the main objective of media and information literacy is to empower the general public to critically assess media and information content and enhance the capacity of individuals to detect this information. The primary beneficiaries of media and information literacy are youth, educators, journalists and media professionals, political candidates, uh, members of political parties, policy makers, civil society organizations, electoral observers, electoral management bodies, voters and the general public. There are two types of inf interventions of media and information literacy, long-term ones and short-term ones. The long-term ones integrate MIL, for instance, into the educational curricula, establishing community engagement programs and advocating for policies that support media use and information literacy to promote sustainable long-term public resilience to information pollution. And these long-term interventions usually take part during childhood and youth and are integrated in the educational, should be integrated, and it's recommendable that they are integrated in the educational, in the formal educational system. Short-term interventions are more related to adult education and empower main electoral stakeholders through workshops, for instance, and voters and citizens through targeted public awareness campaigns. So these interventions are much more targeted, short-term, and are thought for specific purposes. Media and information literacy provide knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values. Knowledge, knowledge that helps to understand artificial intelligence and its effects, good and bad. Skills, skills to uh, help to find reliable information online and, and check information and create checked information and create reliable information. Attitudes that uh, help to think critically and spot and report harmful content online and be aware of the risk of our own biases. And values, that's very important, it's to support human right, human rights approach all through electoral cycle. 
So talking about the electoral cycle, I'm going to refer to MIL initiatives uh, in election settings, um, but because they usually contribute to the integrity and credibility of electoral processes, ensuring that voters are well informed, capable of making uh, informed choices and engage in democratic processes uh, with good information. And these interventions usually also reduce the impact of electoral related disinformation, enhance media literacy skills among general public and stakeholders and reduce the dissemination of disinformation. As I said, they are usually in the form of short term interventions. So um, media and information literacy interventions and campaigns also contribute with electoral related conflict prevention, which is extremely important, depending, of course, in the setting, but conflict prevention, electoral related conflict prevention is a result. It's one of the results of media and information literacy during electoral, electoral cycles. So which are the main challenges of media and information literacy? in elections. First one, it's the super fast evolution of sophisticated and artificial intelligence information pollution methods. As we know, uh, it's very difficult to keep updating our knowledge to the evolution of technology, and that's one of the main challenges. But the second challenge is human-based, and it's related to the use that people and citizens do of the toolkit provided by media and information literacy. How how individuals who have been part of MIL long and short term interventions, they need to effectively apply their knowledge and tools, how they do implement what they learn. And that's another, another challenge. There are different uh, MIL responses aimed at fostering um, civic agency. What is civic agency? Civic agency refers to the capacity of individuals and groups to participate in public life, exercising their rights and contributing to their communities. It includes the ability uh, to engage in democratic processes, advocate for social change and take action on issues of public concern. Civic agency involves not only having the knowledge and skills necessary for civic and political participation, but also the motivation to promote peace and tolerance and curb polarization. So, I'm in this in this um, in this uh, image, you can see. In, in the table, you can see that we have advancements, policy areas, and MIL responses. So, for instance, in advancements, uh, we have, I will say, information search and access. And the policy area is quality of data control, and the MIL responses are empower users to ensure diversity in search, such as results with gender perspectives. So, this is key. Social media participation is related to the policy area of freedom of expression and AML responses stimulate ethical use and the capacity to promote and protect human rights, including freedom of expression and gender equality. Scientific media creation involves the policy areas of creativity and innovation and the AML responses stimulate critical awareness and ethical use voice recognition, computer vision, the policy area that is related to this is accessibility for people with disabilities and non-discrimination. And MIL responses help understand gaps, loses and gains in human digital technology interaction. Speech to text, text to, to, to uh, automatic translation, etc. It talks about inclusion, intercultural dialogue, and cultural diversity as policy areas. And the EMIL responses uh, foster appreciation for translating text from one medium to the another, one language to another, acknowledge dangers involved with changes in messages and media, and also the limits of these translations. And finally, uh, for instance, in the area of advancements, cross-referring of multiple sources, collaborative verification and annotation, fact-checking, etc. 
This policy area is related to participation and contribution, and MIL responses encourage appreciation on how digital technology can support research, empower citizens to avoid AI-generated problems during elections, and key public moments. Everyone has a role to play, from EMBs to political parties, from government to digital platforms. In that sense, UNESCO uh, has developed guidelines for the governance of digital platform because in UNESCO we believe that platforms are uh, key, uh, key stakeholders in the whole issue of the pollution of disinformation and hate speech uh, during elections and all along the electoral cycle for the matters. And uh, these guidelines were a multi-stakeholder process where more than representatives of 130 countries participated. And we received more than 10,000 comments from every corner of the world. It was a super inclusive process in, in that where people from all kinds of backgrounds, including um, minorities and marginalized and vulnerable groups also participated and in the in the in these guidelines um, uh, these guidelines highlight the importance of media and information literacy because they put emphasis on the empowerment of users uh, promote cultural diversity social inclusion and global citizenship and uh, they aim at, uh, um, media and information literacy aims at reducing the participation gap. That means uh, to create the critical use of media and information content for everyone. And uh, promote uh, media and information literacy promotes gender equality and women's empowerment and provides opportunities for participation by groups in situation of vulnerability or marginalization, which is is really important. So, in UNESCO guidelines for the governments of digital platforms, uh, the governments, according to these guidelines, governments should promote media literacy and online safety, especially for vulnerable groups, by educating users about their rights and collaborating with experts. Digital platforms should prioritize empowering users and enhancing digital literacy, focusing on vulnerable groups. Electoral bodies and civil society organizations should advocate for human rights and collaborate to implement effective media literacy programs. And journalists should contribute to transparency in elections and trust in media by fact-checking and verifying information. Hello and welcome to part three of module four. In this module, we are going to talk about ethical impact assessments. First, we'll describe what is an ethical impact assessment, why should we conduct these on AI systems, and then I will invite you to conduct an AI ethical impact assessment for an AI system based on some of the tools that I will be sharing. So let's dive in. Ethical impact assessments help us in identifying the positive and negative impacts of AI systems throughout their life cycle. It helps us to safeguard the benefits and avoid its harms. Such assessments should help us identify, for instance, uh, if an AI system is impacting human rights and fundamental freedoms, and how. It is also important to know that ethical impact assessments are not new. They've been widely used in domains of finance, cybersecurity, privacy, and data protection, and also environmental studies. There are several reasons for conducting ethical impact assessment. First, it is really a functional requirement to identify the weaknesses in an AI system. For instance, if there are biases in such a system coming through data or other sources, can we, we, we identify those and then we can help address those biases. Second, it's also an organizational imperative where we want to have better governance systems in place when we are using AI systems to improve oversight of these systems and to ensure regulatory compliance. Third, in terms of individuals, they can also benefit from better protection of their rights if these assessments are conducted on AI systems. And finally, to promote the social good, whether it is in the form of promoting innovation or sustainable development or enhancing the trust in technologies. Let us consider some examples of AI systems on which we could do an ethical impact assessment. And I would then invite you to think of other examples or use these to actually conduct the ethical impact assessments and then share your thoughts in the forum. 
So let's consider, for instance, an AI chatbot, which is used for providing authentic information to voters on the websites of electoral management body. Another example would be an AI system used by election management bodies to create audio, visual, or text-based communications content in multiple languages to enhance voter awareness. Another one would be an AI system that was used to detect fraud on a daily basis by analyzing the video footage at polling stations, or an AI system that scans through the affidavits that candidates put forward while making their applications to become candidates. And this AI system could help detect anomalies in the information that is disclosed by the candidates by looking at other sources of information, but also past affidavits from these candidates. Finally, an AI system, as we know in, from previous modules, is used by social media platforms to detect hate speech, report it, and to take it down. These are just some of the examples. There can be many more, and they can be much more detailed. So I invite you to, to reflect a bit more and share these in the chat. Now, talking about some of the tools, in the readings, we've added the UNESCO Ethical Impact Assessment Tool. It has several segments. Uh, the first one is around scoping questions that help us understand the objectives of an AI system, the context in which the system is being deployed, and whether we have an associated project governance system in place. And then it also helps us understand whether different stakeholder groups are involved in conducting these assessments. The second segment of the ethical impact assessment from UNESCO talks about the alignment of the AI system with the principles in the UNESCO recommendation, which we talked about in the first module. So just as a recap, these include safety and security, fairness, privacy and data protection, transparency and explainability, amongst others. Let us briefly look at some of the questions. This is not at all going to be exhaustive, but just to give you a sense of what kind of questions this tool is posing. So uh, when we talk about scoping questions, first we are trying to describe an AI system, identify its objectives and the problem that it is trying to solve. Then we move on to the roles and responsibilities uh, within the project governance setup that different actors have uh, while, while they are managing this project or uh, using these systems. This helps us fix accountability, ensures transparency uh, while the AI system is being deployed. Moving on to the, the alignment with the principles, uh, for, for instance, in this case, we consider the principle of non-discrimination, where we assess whether the algorithm has been tested with different stakeholder groups or not, whether an analysis of the training data and the testing data, we talked about this in previous modules, training data and testing data are important ingredients of an AI system, and we need to analyze whether there are biases in these training data and uh, test data itself. So these uh, questions help us reflect more deeply on uh, the sources or potential entry points of biases. This is just an example of uh, questions that we would need uh, to need to think about while conducting an ethical impact assessment. And I invite you to look at the document for more details. Just to conclude this part, uh, an ethical impact assessment helps entities that are deploying these systems to reflect carefully on the impact of AI systems. And these tools should always be deployed in a multi-stakeholder manner with the potential users involved in the assessment process. Finally, if uh, you are a, in an organization that is procuring AI systems, going through this ethical impact assessment tool will give you valuable information on how to frame the terms and reference of uh, procurement contracts and so on. With this, I would like to thank you for joining us on this journey, and I hope you had a good learning experience. Bye-bye. Greetings and welcome back. We are reaching the conclusion of this course. In previous modules, we have explored many of the opportunities and challenges of artificial intelligence for the information ecosystem and the elections. For AI to have a positive impact, its risks need to be mitigated. In this video, I will summarize some of the options we have presented so far and add a few more activities. Coalitions is the first uh, example I will mention. Addressing the risk of AI for the information ecosystem is a multidimensional endeavor. We have seen coalition producing key results. 
those specialize in the responsible use of AI, in electoral assistance, or in promoting a healthy information ecosystem, need to respond and coordinate much faster than before. Coalitions can be an efficient setup to draw rapidly on the diversity of skill sets, mandates, and roles. Experience also show that coalitions can create leverage to address the significant power imbalance between, on one hand, national institutions, CSOs, and stakeholders, especially in countries willing to bridge the digital gap, and global companies, on the other hand, which operate with limited regulation and extensive resources. I highly recommend the upcoming videos of our speakers for this module four to get more insights and more examples. A last point on coalitions. Um, they have a great potential to support the governance of AI. They can help guide the balancing act between increased access to AI while addressing its risk for the information ecosystem and the credibility of the elections. At national level, coalitions can impact regulatory efforts by informing the decision making with evidence and knowledge. They, they can also monitor and promote inclusive and transparent legis legislative processes. However, on this last note of regulation, uh, regulation can be quickly outpaced. Implementation and enforcement are challenging. There is a need to anticipate the risks and mitigate them early in the electoral cycle. To preventive measures. Coalitions are also a good mean, a good setup to address uh, and take those preventive measures. Let's have a look at those measures. There are some of the possible activities which prove useful in other, in different contexts. First, uh, Albertina Peterback just presented the advantages of media and information literacy programs. Together with civic and voter education and digital inclusion literacy, these programs can help citizens to become more resilient to online disinformation. It can also help them to regain some control over what they can trust in the information ecosystem. And in the end, enhance participation. Osama Ajaber, my colleague, uh, also uh, added uh, some of the ways and tools to detect AI-generated content, both manually and automatically. As mentioned in module two, it has been documented that social media promote polarizing content and that content moderation is lacking. This leads me to the second type of activities that we have seen uh, used and quite successfully. Because these uh, issues of polarizing content and lack of content moderation increase the risk of violence, in particular towards underrepresented and vulnerable groups. So it's critical to address them so that they can participate. To mitigate this risk, uh, Osama Al-Jaber, my colleague, presented in module three different UNDP tools which can help analyze trends online and monitor social media platforms. But also, they can support our national partners to verify and fact check content. A related activity is social listening. With those tools, social listening can be used to monitor narratives and perception and enable timely response to prevent gender-based violence, for instance. Again, for all those tools, clear protocols and agreements for data collection, storage, and usage of data must be established to prevent misuse. A third activity that is helpful um, is related to the demand by electoral authority um, to get support as they are still building the systems, processes, and skills to boost their strategic communication. Electoral assistance can help EMBs to mitigate issues of trust in electoral processes and misinformation uh, with the development of time-bound communication strategies, with proactive dissemination of accurate information, and with increased stakeholders engagement, including with online companies. With all these measures of strategic communication, EMBs can drastically improve the transparency of the process and the perception of the institution. 
A fourth example of activity are the voluntary commitments that can be uh, uh, adhered to by stakeholders, such as political parties, candidates, officials, and media. And those commitments to use technologies responsibly can make an important contribution to a healthy ecosystem and to credible electoral processes. Monitoring and enforcement of those commitments often prove challenging, but they can be enhanced by building coalitions to monitor the, the implementation of commitments and extensive consultation of the stakeholders. This will lead to better buy-in and adhesion to the commitments. Finally, training in media, in election, in AI, to all three communities of practitioners can help. There are, of course, other measures. You can find an overview in a publication that UNDP just issued on information integrity for electoral institutions and processes. The publication provides a synthetic overview, including remarks on the measurement of the impact. Let me show you the, an example of two measures and the um, uh, layout of this publication that makes it very easy to uh, screen it. Finally, on the way forward, let me add a few remarks. Let's first remind um, the final recommendation on the introduction of AI. My colleague Pratik Sibal recommended uh, in this same module to conduct an ethical test for all the projects involving AI. It is also recommended to adhere to digital principles, such as those outlined in the UNDP digital standards. As EMBs and CSO, CSOs increasingly procure AI-powered system for their work, the aspect of ensuring a shared under, understanding among electoral stakeholders, conduct trials and training, as well as ensuring sustainability, transparency, and ownership of the systems are critical. Cyber, cyber security concerns are also to be considered. To conclude, all the measures previously mentioned combine long existing activities in the field of governance support and electoral assistance, since many of these issues are not fundamentally new. At the same time, resorting to innovative capacities, often using AI systems, is critical. As we are already hearing about AI with reasoning capacities, we will need to continue our efforts to assess to boost support measures and to, and to innovate. Thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to receiving your feedback on our forum. Well, my dear friends, this is the end, at least the end of our journey together. We hope you have found the MOOC both interesting and useful. The content of this course is the result of an incredible collaborative effort. Uh, with over 20 people working together day and night under the coordination of the exceptional team of the Knight Center for Journalism in the Americas. So thank you very much to them. I would also like to take a moment to highlight the outstanding contributions of my dear colleagues Pratik Sival from UNESCO and Tatiana Monet and Osama al Haber from UNDP. Their dedication and expertise have been instrumental in shaping the content of this course. Uh, also, I want to express my gratitude to our fantastic assistant instructors, Julie Godignon, Cristina perez Glaze, Lucas Novaes Ferreira, and Anas Bendrif. Um, their tireless efforts in conducting the MOOC in French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Arabic are having reached the learning experience for hundreds of students all around the world. So thank you very much, guys, for being there and for a fantastic job. And finally, I would like to thank you all because uh, your participation in the MOOC um, and, the, and the support you show for freedom of expression, democratic processes, elections and human rights is really important to us. It's, it's what motivates us. And your involvement and enthusiasm has been truly inspiring for the whole team. So thank you very much. And we'll see you at the next MOOC. Bye bye.